you will begin the recording and where you can start sharing. And floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay, great. So first I would like to start with a thank Maxim and Thomas to uh, start this wonderful uh, seminar series. It's really important uh, for our community to continue the um, scientific communication and this is really wonderful. So today, uh, I would like to uh, show you a little bit of recent progress on ultrafast dynamics and interactions of molecular vibration protons in my book. So thanks for Kevin's talk, um, the I believe the first talk uh, of this series. You guys might already uh, be familiar, a little bit familiar with uh, the term molecular vibrational proton. I just like to give you a little bit about my perspective about what it is. So in chemistry, we are fam very familiar with the concept of hybridization. We have hybridization for J aggregates, K, uh, H aggregates. We have hybridization between vibrational modes of beta sheets. We also teach our, 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 um, our uh, un undergrad student about molecular orbital uh, theories. For all of them, they have something similar. That is when we put individual uh, orbitals very close to each other, they have very good uh, spatial overlap then they start to uh, have a large coupling term and then those individual orbitals would um, interact with each other and form new eigenstates. Once they form new eigenstates, they would have new energy levels and also the excitation itself is delocalized. So this is a very common con uh, concept in chemistry. And that may help us to understand what proton is a little bit. So for proton, it's very similar to um, hybridization between two molecules, uh, between two uh, atomic uh, orbitals, except now we need to replace one of these matter resonance with a cavity resonance. So we need to first form a cavity resonance. The easiest way to form a cavity resonance is by this uh, so-called fiber pro cavity. You just take two partial reflective mirror and put them really, really close to each other. So how close? If I'm interested in a vibrational mode, so let's say five micron vibrational mode, then I need to make the distance between the two um, partial reflecting mirror to be a half integer of the five micron. So that means that I can form a 2.5 micron mode, I can form a, a 10 micron cavity mode or 25 micron cavity mode. It would always ensure there is one order of cavity that would, um, would form around five micron. So if we take a, let's say FTR spectrum, we'll see this, um, Lorentzian uh, function type of um, spectrum. But if we measure it in the time domain, this is a simulation result, then we can see it, the, the signal will just decay as exponential, which indicates how far, uh, how, how long the, the photon would be trapped inside of the cavity. So now we have this these, uh, cavity mode in place. And then we need to add the molecular component. Let's imagine we just put one single molecule inside of the cavity. This is the ideal case. We want one single molecule interact with one single cavity. Then this molecule can actually, under the driving force of, of this virtual photon, it can would also oscillate. It would extract that, and then it would emit a, a field. Okay, based on theory. And this field often is in the opposite phase of the cavity field, so it generates a dip. It has not. It's had nothing different from the typical absorption spectroscopy that we see so far. More important is to characterize it in the time domain. You see, you will see both the vibration mode and cavity mode, they just exponential decay. So like the weak coupling case, any type of a pump probe experiment that we see. So this is actually not strong coupling. Why is not strong coupling? The answer is actually very easy. So the mode or the mode volume of a vibrational mode is on the order of angstrom, right? Very, very small. And I just told you that the, 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 the thickness or the, the length of a cavity is on the order of micron. So there's a huge volume mismatch between those two. Of course, that they will not have a good spatial overlap. So you don't feel the, the, the strong coupling. Okay, so this is the key. Um, and then in order to make strong coupling, one might think that, okay, we might want to make the cavity to be really, really small, make it to match with the a volume of, of a single molecule. So, so people are pursuing that. It's very difficult. You might heard a term of pico cavity and stuff like that, but that's very challenging. There is an easier way to make if you just want to make a strong coupling that is putting a lot of molecules inside of the cavity. So what happens 
Uh, the, all those molecules, they would couple to the cavity mode together and form the so-called uh, uh, DC super radiance mode. So you can see this ensemble of molecules as a microscopic large uh, vibrational polarization, uh, polarization. This large microscopic polarization would have a large enough volume to match with the volume of the cavity mode. And therefore, the strong coupling can be formed. So if we then measure the FTR spectrum, you will see that one single cavity mode to split into two um, polariton mode. And this lower peak, uh, frequency peak would uh, be referred as the lower polariton, and uh, the, the higher frequency peak usually is referred as upper polariton. The separation that we can easily measure by the linear spectrum are the so-called Rabi splitting here, okay? More importantly, if we characterize everything in the time domain, what we will find is that in the time domain, the excitation that we put into either the vibrational mode or the cavity mode will not stay in those modes. They would exchange over the time of, of, of the lifetime of either mode. And that means that the energy would not stay in either mode and they are not good um, eigenstate anymore. That's why we need the proton state to deprive the system. So this is the, the signature of onset of, of, of strong copy, basically. So what I just told you can also be summarized in this um, nice equation here. That is, if we characterize the, um, the Rabi splitting, which is twice of the collective coupling strength, it is it did depend on the square root of the molecular concentration. So that's important. It de depends on the square root of the molecular concentration. And as long as we find the separation and the Rabi splitting is larger than the Fourier half max of either the matter mode and also uh, both the matter mode and the cavity mode, then we know we are in the strong coupling regime. So why that people are interested in the, this um, um, uh, uh, man-made um, hybridization quasi particles, it is because now we are actually um, hybridizing two entirely different entities together. Right? So molecule can react, molecule are heavy, and molecule have um, unharmonicities, but light are very, I mean, photons are very light and they don't interact with each other, but they also can form this delocalized mode. So people think that when you mix those two very um, distinct um, particles together, that there might be emerging interesting property happen in both the molecular property, say, changing a chemical reaction, as well as the photonic um, characterizations. Um, so I will show you some of those evidence uh, of our work, but I will start with a slide uh, summarizing one of uh, these, uh, these uh, groundbreaking results from Thomas Abbasson's group who, who started this field. So they showed that if they put, study this specific reaction, okay, this is a, this is a reaction that can undergo either a carbon silicon bond uh, breaking or um, oxygen silicon bond breaking to form either uh, the, the product one or two. They show that if they put the reactants inside of the cavity without any put input of photon, okay, so just a thermal reaction, they can actually change the selectivity to make uh, the, the reaction to be more favored of, of product two instead of product one. They also show that the overall reaction actually is slowed down compared to when you run the reaction outside. So their explanation is that when you form proton, you change the, you now form new eigenstates, so the, the energy landscape has been changed. But there, there's a more than, um, than this explanation, and people are still pursuing and trying to understand what happened to this reaction so that this type of a phenomenon can be predicted and, and happen more. So that is also part of our driven force. Uh, want to use ultra-fast spectroscopy to study that. But um, we haven't got to there to fully understand a, a reaction like this, but hopefully I'll show you some of the progress. It's very exciting progress along the way. So to study it, we want to also just calibrate our spectroscopy and make sure that we understand what the spectroscopy features are. So we pick our favorite um, molecule that is tungsten hexacarbonyl. You know, you all know why that we want to use that. It has a very, very strong transition dipole moment and very narrow language, so it's perfect to form proton. We just make a, a hexane solution, put it into the cyberporal cavity, then if we measure the, the transmission spectrum, we can see uh, two well-resolved um, proton modes that are separate about 40 wave number. So it's way beyond the fluid half max of either the cavity mode or the vibration mode. So we know 
we should be in this strong coupling regime. But before I show you any result, I will also want to give you a caveat. So typically people would describe the proton as a, as a two by two matrix. So you have a molecular mode and cavity mode. You have the coupling term and, the, and, the, and then couple them together. And then they will form two new um, eigenmode that is upper and lower proton. In reality, I told you that we need to put a lot of molecules there, right? 10 to the 10th. So it's really not a two by two matrix. It's, it's an N plus one matrix and this N is ginormous. So you can do this practice by putting, you know, 100 by 100 matrix and diagonalize yourself. What you find is that, interestingly, that the new eigenstate that you find would still have two bright states that correspond to the upper and lower um, proton that are energy speed from the original state. But you have also n minus one dark state. They they have two characters. The dark state do not pick up any photon character, so they don't actually interact with with photons. Okay, they, they don't have the cavity component. And secondly, that their energy are just like the free molecule, so their energy also is not changed. However, they are the 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 silent majority, right? This n minus one n is very very large, so we cannot really ignore them, and we will show that sometimes they, they show up in, in our spectrum. So, the two, so I will show you some of uh, the uh, spectral signature that we, we studied, and then later show you two very interesting phenomena that, that, that we find using ultrafast spectroscopy. So we do pump probe and also 2D R spectrum. When we do pump probe, we take a infrared pump to excite the, the uh, proton and the infrared probe to probe the transmission. So this is how you see it in, in the experiment that if we just chop a pump pulse and measure the probe pulse, we can see that at very short time delay, we simply can modulate the probe transmission spectrum by making it smaller if we pump the system. If we take the difference and normalize it, which is usually how you get a pump probe, you see this purely absorptive shaped top line set. Okay. So this is a signature of proton proton interaction. We can further characterize, of course, by 2D spectroscopy. You don't need me to tell detail about this slide, actually. But we use the pulse shaper method by phase type, and um, that we scan the T1 time delay between the two pump pulses to characterize the force um, coherence, and then launch the probe pulse um, to characterize another coherence, and then measure the correlation between them by scanning T2. You can further transform the coherence uh, in the time domain to get the, the frequency domain spectrum. And for a proton system, so remember that I have one vibrational uh, couple with a cavity mode, so that I split uh, the vibrational mode into two bright eigenstates. So now in the linear spectrum, you will see two um, transmission peaks. The two peaks uh, would also translate into two diagonal peaks, okay, correspond to the upper and lower proton. And then if there are any interactions between the upper and lower proton, we would also expect to see cross peaks. And this is a spectrum that we see here. So you can see that there is cross uh, diagonal peaks for the upper proton and lower proton. There are also cross peaks indicating there is um, coupling and interactions between them. There are also some other peaks that, that are small, and those are actually the signature of the dark mode. So it turns out the dark mode are not completely dark because of a chemical inhomogeneity, but I'm gonna, not gonna focus on that for today. But the signature that you, I want to show you is that there is this a, um, a square feature formed by these four peaks. That's, that is a spectral signature for a pair of proton. And the useful thing about, about taking 2DR, of course, is not that we can, we can study the dynamics much more carefully, uh, but I want to point out that you can see in the 2DR that we also see majority absorptive type of line shape that agree with the pump probe that are really well. What we do is we can take a spectral cut at, uh, um, uh, at upper proton, for example. And, and by the way, that now that the 2D spectrum, this is the pump excitation frequency, and this is a probe frequency. So if you calibrate from Allen spectrum, you can either tilt your screen or tilt your head now. Um, but then anyway, if we take the spectral cut, we can scan the T2 time delay. What we find is um, like many quantum systems, we can see a very beautiful oscillations of this absorptive feature. The oscillation period uh, is about 0.8 picoseconds. So that corresponds to a frequency of 40 wave number. That, that agree with the rabbit splitting we measure in the frequency domain really, really well. 
So we know that this is a, a, um, a Rabi oscillation or a coherence basically formed during the T2 time between the, uh, uh, between the lower and, and the upper parietal. But it um, only lasts about, about three to, to five picoseconds because of this is our parietal lifetime. What we are excited about this is now that we can form this uh, coherence pair that um, oscillates very strongly. So that could be a potential qubit in the future. Um, and we try to also manipulate um, those um, qubits uh, by uh, doing additional pulse shaping using the pulse shaper. For example, we can use the pulse shaper to only excite uh, the upper proton case so that we will create an up, upper proton, upper proton uh, population. We will still see the spectrum corresponding to exciting the upper proton, but if we scan the dynamics, we see a full population dynamic. Or we can create an upper proton, lower proton coherence using the pulse shaper. Although that we see from the spectroscopy part, they all show up in the same place. But if we scan the, the, uh, the T2 time delay now, the dynamics become fully just coherent. So we, we can basically show that we can manipulate you know, the system to maybe either prepare a population or, or coherent state. So this is so much about the spectral signature of proton well within the proton lifetime. So about zero to five picosecond or sometimes to 10 picosecond depend on the cavity, um, cavity lifetime. But you can all, we can also scan the pump probe time delay to be very much longer, uh, like uh, what I show you in this pump probe trace in this regime. In this regime, the proton states are not there anymore because the, uh, the cavity photon lifetime are very, very short. So the proton actually would lose its photon character. So there is about 2,000 wave number of energy it needs to dump. So it can't dump it very, very easily. However, because there is a large dark mode that I told you before that serves as a reservoir state. So it's actually relatively easy for proton to either lose or gain some about 20 wave number of energy to just go to the dark mode. And this is also people why I call it a dark reservoir mode. When it goes to the dark mode, the spectral signature also change. This is the pump probe spectrum. Now you can see there is a large derivative shape on the upper proton side and a small derivative shape and also a large absorption shape on the lower proton side. The reason now the spectrum changed to the, the, the derivative shape is due to the so-called Rabi splitting. So remember that the Rabi splitting of proton system is proportional to the square root of, of concentration. In the pump probe experiment, when the proton localized into the dark mode. So it's equivalent to actually remove some of the ground state into the excited state. So the ground state molecule that I have in the system that can be strongly coupled with the cavity become less. Therefore, this concentration becomes smaller. So the rubbish bleeding also becomes smaller. That is why that both the lower proton, upper proton would move inward that we can well capture in the simulation and then generate the, this uh, derivative shape, as you can see from the simulation. You can also see a little bit derivative uh, shape that is on, on the lower proton side, but however, it's dominated by, by, this large, um, by this large absorptive shape. So what is that? That is due to that we haven't taken into account that our, our reservoir mode, our, our dark mode, are also unharmonic. They are just like molecular modes. So we all know that the one to two transition, the over two transition of the dark uh, of the molecular mode would be um, red shifted compared to the fundamental mode. And it happened to actually overlap with, with the spectral window of the lower proton. Therefore, it can borrow the spectral window of the lower proton and generate this very large um, large absorptions um, feature, okay? But so this feature now at this longer time delay is not re already not a response of the proton anymore, but a um, response of the dark mode. And that is why that you see this feature of the proton mode would die away really quick. And then the dark mode itself is that will grow, grow in. However, it's also a very useful spectral signature that we use to follow dynamics happened to the dark mode, which we'll use extensively later. So with that, um, oh, the other thing I want to show you, for the 2D spectrum, basically, we see the same spectral feature. We see derivative shape on the upper proton side and purely absorptive shape in the lower proton side. 
with those um, spec um, understanding of spectral features, I want to show you two interesting uh, scientific findings. The first one is intermolecular vibrational energy transform. Um, so the conversation started that um, when I discussed with my, my colleague for a while that we realized that in electronic transitions that energy transfer happens a lot, such as uh, faster energy resonant energy transfer or vector energy transfer. Part of the reason is because of the dipole moment of electronic state are large so that the dipole-dipole interaction are also large. But when we talk about vibrational mode, it's about 10% or 1% of electronic state. So that makes the dipole-dipole interaction become much smaller. So we say if we put different molecules inside of, of, of a, a system, there is no directional energy transfer. The energy can dissipate to anywhere, but it's in, indirectional, with a few exceptions such as water. Okay. So our idea is then, can we guide energy transfer by having two mo different molecules to all couple to the photon mode? Pretty much like that, we cannot talk to each other now without the internet. So we want to find a, a, a intermediate, you know, a media to, to enable this channel. So we wonder if strong coupling would be able to do that. To test this idea, we basically synthesize some isotope labeled um, Thompson hyperparam mu, which makes them to be distinguishable, but also separated about just enough that both of the mode can be strongly coupled to the parity mode now. So now that instead of describing the uh, the, the proton using a two by two matrix, we need to describe it by a three by three matrix, where the individual vibrational mode do not couple to each other, but they all couple to the same parity mode. All right. So what you see are these type of um, three proton systems that I have an upper proton, a middle proton, and lower proton. A student can change the beam incident angle or the, the implant K vector to get the so-called dispersion curve um, of the proton. And this is important because then combining this uh, with the uh, matrix Hamiltonian, we can actually solve the so-called hub, hub field coefficient of the protons. And from that, if we take the square, we can actually know the composition of each proton. For example, for the upper proton, you can see the upper proton are mostly composed by the donor molecule and the cavity mode and small amount of acceptor molecule. Therefore, the lower proton that is mostly composed by the acceptor molecule um, and a very small portion of the donor molecule. The middle proton are completely mixed. All right. So if we take the square root, we can basically characterize the composition of each proton. So now we take 2D spectrum, starting from an uncoupled system. This we mix the two tungsten and tungsten carbonyl together. You can see there is a fundamental and overtone mode of each of uh, the molecule, but there's lack of fast indicating there's no energy transfer. We did a quick calculation using the standard formula of faster energy transfer. We find the transfer rate is also um, minimal. So what happens if we put it into strong coupling regime? Well, if we put it into strong coupling, we get a spectrum like this. It's very much more complicated, first of all, we have way more peaks, uh, but we can sort them out. Remember, for each pair of proton, we always see expect to see these um, four peaks uh, forming a square pattern. So we can break our three protons into two pairs. There, there is an upper and middle proton pair that would form this square feature, and uh, a middle and lower proton pair that would form this square feature. So if we take into all those um, so we identify there is a new peak, that is this peak, between when we excite the upper proton and the probe and the lower proton region. So the question is, is that a signature of uh, energy transfer? So again, we can see that the pump um, frequency tells us we are putting energy into the upper proton here, where that when we probe, we are probing the lower proton. But again, because the time delay that we probe here is very much longer than the lifetime of the proton, 
we are really probing the dark mode of the lower proton, which happened to be the accept uh, the one to two transition of the acceptor mode. In comparison, we can also look at uh, what these uh, spectral signatures correspond to. It corresponds to the middle proton region, and that that is composed mostly by the dark uh, by the dark mode of the donor. Therefore, that actually by tracking or, or tracking the intensity of this peak and this peak, we can know when we put energy into the upper proton, how much of energy would dissipate into the donor mode or dissipate into the acceptor mode to know if there's energy transfer. But there is a caveat of that because it could also be just a simple uh, energy relaxation. Remember that although the upper proton are mostly composed by the donor, it's also composed by a small uh, fraction of the acceptor, right? So that's why these hot field coefficients are important. But if we take the ratio between the, you know, the hot field coefficient, we know that the except expected ratio between the donor and the acceptor peak should be 14 to one. Experimentally, we find the ratio is a, a lot larger, okay? So the portion of the acceptor is a lot larger. And this is the, uh, the key um, actually finding our signature that make us to, to believe what we see is a, med a, a proton mediated energy transfer from the donor to acceptor because the population of the acceptor when we put energy into the um, upper proton is much larger than expected from a purely energy relaxation. We can also measure the kinetics and the kinetics also tell us those two peaks are different. So the, the orange curve corresponds to the energy relaxation. You can see that it happened very, very fast. However, the energy transfer uh, channel actually happened about five picoseconds, still within the cavity lifetime. That means th this is a process you know, mediated by the cavity. Another interesting experiment that we did is we can change the cavity thickness. We can put it into five micron 12.5 micron, 25 micron, it all makes sure that there is one order of cavity that can strongly couple to the system. And we find that actually the ratio between these two peaks increase, that corresponding that we have more energy transfer character as we increase the cavity thickness. And why that's the case? So although when I change the cavity thickness, the round trip, num total number of round trip of the, the photon do not change, but the path length become uh, increases, right? So it means the time, the overall time for a photon be trapped inside of the cavity become larger. And therefore there's more time for the photon to mediate the energy transfer. And that's why that we see the uh, enhancement of the energy transfer channel, right? So we are very excited about, about this work because it's the first time that people show that we can enable energy transfer between vibrational mode in a, in a you know, engineering way. And there are some uh, experiment uh, from Abbotson's group uh, um, they show that uh, when they have a small amount of reactants to couple with the solvent mode, they can promote the reaction and they, they, they propose a, 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 a mechanism that there is corroborativity and also energy transfer between them. And we think this is one of the, the, the first experimental evidence for that. So next, uh, with um, the remaining time, I will quickly go through some unpublished result that is about a intercavity nonlinear interaction between protons. So what I just showed you is that if I have two vibrational modes and have both of them coupled to one cavity mode, I can have these two vibrational modes to talk to each other. So we just thought, pure, based on curiosity, what if we flip the role between you know, the two parties? What if we have two cavity modes and we have one vibrational mode, can we for make the two cavity mode all couple to one vibrational mode and make the two cavity mode talk to each other. Is that possible? And this is also uh, important uh, from a practical application because if we can enable cavity coupling and cavity interaction, then we might be able to use uh, those protons as a platform for, for uh, quantum uh, simulation and, and also other, other applications. So to try this, we fabricate this type of cavity, we, are, we, we call it checkerboard cavity, so that the, we, on this, uh, the, the optics, that we, we have uh, individual squares where the neighboring square has a, a slightly different height. 
So if we put these optics against a regular cavity optics, we would have two cavities that right adjacent to each other, but have a slightly different uh, uh, cavity thickness difference. And that allow the neighboring cavity to support two different cavity modes. Okay, our hope is that if that's the case, and then if there's always always some delocalization of uh, the photon mode, so the evanescence wave between the two cavities would mix with each other, it might enable some interesting nonlinear vibration. So naively, we thought if we have two cavity mode and one vibrational mode, we can couple them together to form three polaritum. And the linear spectrum tells us that's not even the case. We see four peaks. All right, why four peaks? That is because each individual cavity mode actually only strongly coupled with the molecule inside their own cavity. That means although I only have one vibrational, one type of vibration mode, but they break into two sub-ensembles, that one sub-ensemble would strongly coupled with cavity A from two proton, the other sub-ensemble would form cavity uh, proton with cavity B. And that's why we have four peaks, all right? That's a little bit disappointing because that might mean that we cannot couple the two cavity modes together. Of course, I won't tell you the story if that's the case. So that, then we tried a little bit harder. We basically tried to first model the linear spectrum using two type of model. In the fourth model, we just assume the photon would come into cavity A, bounce around, and then leave cavity A, never go to cavity B. So that's cavity B. Where in the second model, we would open the channel that we would allow the photon to enter from the cavity A side and bounce around a little bit, but has a chance to actually go to cavity B side and bounce around before it leaves the cavity. Okay, so you can see in summary that if we use the, the, the force model, the model one, we can capture the peak frequency pretty well, but we cannot capture the peak intensity. And the mismatch of the peak intensity means there must be some redistribution of, of photons. So then if we in, include this photon hopping channel or the localization channel, we can well capture the, the linear spectrum intensity now. And from the linear spectrum, it already taught us there are delocalization inside all those systems. This is also supported by a infrared imaging. So we my student basically just um, changed the spectrometer into an imaging set up by, by blowing up uh, the uh, spectrum. And then we send it into the entrance of a monochromator. What my student does is then they, they take, use a, a slit to cut a vertical image of, uh, for example, this, this image here, and then send this vertical image into the spectrometer where the spectrometer would disperse the signal along the vertical axis and then, and then um, measure the spatial distribution along the, uh, sorry, uh, disperse the spectrum along the horizontal axis and measure the spatial information along the vertical axis on the, uh, on the SPA array uh, from phase time. All right, so then what we can see is a spectral image of that help us to identify the, the, the proton of each in the cavity and their spatial positions. So you can see that, that, that there are these two protons from cavity B and two protons from cavity A. They are displaced by about 40 microns, but they also mix together, indicating there is uh, evanescence waves between them. So we learned how to measure 2DR. So here is another very complicated, well, in my opinion, complicated 2DR with many peaks. Again, because I have two pairs of proton, so I'm expecting a, a square feature from these two pair up, uh, lower proton one, lower proton, uh, upper proton one, and also another pair from the lower proton two and upper proton two. Then once we take into account all those features, we can identify the feature that, that is not being accounted. And those, those are the plastic that has not been accounted. And student did a cleaner experiment by basically tailoring the pump pulses to only excite uh, the upper proton one and upper proton two. By doing that, you, you can see we only see spectrum on, uh, along the, uh, those peaks are along omega one, but we can also see a spectral signature of uh, LP2 and the UP2 along the omega-3 axis. What that tells us is now we know spec from spectroscopy feature by exciting upper proton in cavity, uh, cavity one, 
we actually perturb this Graviton feature in CAVDB. We can further, uh, you can also see this spectrum by taking spectral card. You can see the cross peak here and a big cross peak here. We can further simulate uh, using the transform matrix model where if we include both delocalization and nonlinearity, you can see that this is the simulated red curve that re, um, reproduce the experimental cut really, really well. But if we only include uh, the, um, the delocalization, that is, means that um, we stop the communication between the two cavity mode. We, the nonlinear feature become a nonlinear uh, spectrum of a single cavity photon. Or if we can make the molecular uh, mode to be purely harmonic, by doing that, we simply just, this is the green curve, we simply don't have any signal. Of course, that because this is the case because the vibrational mode is the only source of, of nonlinearity. So that means we need both cavity delocalization and molecular uh, nonlinearity. So this is, I think, the last slide. But the last thing we want to show is that spatially we can exciting, you know, pluriton in the cavity A and then perturb the neighboring cavity, right? The way that my student did it is to use a pulse shaper to shape the, the pulse to only excite the upper and lower proton one in cavity A. And when we image the nonlinear response, this is the nonlinear uh, signal of, of nonlinear, the image of the nonlinear signal, we can see we not only just excite the proton in cavity A, but also excite the proton in cavity B in both cases. So we know we achieve a delocalized nonlinearity between the two cavities that is separated about 50 micron. And with that, I just like to uh, conclude that I hope that I showed you the spectral signature of vibrational protons. And those spectra are actually useful, signature are useful because they can be developed to as ultrafast uh, optical modulators. And I hope to show you that, that vibrational uh, proton can actually change uh, the energy flow between molecules. And also it might have some potential uh, because of the nonlinear interactions between cavities for uh, quantum simulation and photonic circuitry. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, last slide. I want to thank the students, sorry. And, and I just want to give a big shout about about this work. It's done by this amazing grad student, um, Bo Xiang. He has done most of the work. The, and also thank the rest of the group. Thank my collaborators for well enjoy and Rebel, Rafa Ribeiro who help us with the theory part. And also my collaborators, uh, Adam, Jeff, and Blake in NRL. And also funding source from NSF and DAPA and uh, also to support, support the research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wei. So, floor's open for questions. Maybe while people are thinking, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, uh, when you had the, the two different uh, molecules in the um, in the cavity, uh, you saw the, the transfer between them. So, what is determining the transfer rate between them, and can you? Um, can you change that? Good question. Um, the other way that we, uh, so it, I think it's in the supplemental material. What my student found is that if we are not a strong, if the strong coupling strength is not strong enough, for example, then we don't see the peak. So, so I, I think it has to be um, strong enough. That's one way to, to, to do it. And, uh, and actually, if we increase, keep increasing the coupling strength, we can we can see stronger peaks. Yeah, but that but does it also point. change the 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 rate, or it's always the same rate of chain of uh, transfer between the? the... Mm. You mean you mean the basically the rising curve? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I I don't I don't I don't know. We, we actually didn't uh, go that uh, route of uh, quantity quantify that we uh, what we try to quantify was just how much the transfer will happen yeah that's that's a good point i will check that thank you thomas okay paul go ahead okay hey, yeah. oh sorry uh, fan fantastic talk um my question started when i was thinking about the checkerboard so i started thinking about the focusing of your beam 
and what the size was, whether you're covering, you know, one of the, the little checkerboard patterns or both, or you can move the sample around and see uh, changes in the behavior. But then another question came to me was, um, so you have a, a three picosecond uh, cavity lifetime-ish. So, so in terms of round trips, how, how many sort of average round trips does that correspond to? And, and what are the effects of you having a tightly focused beam there? So presumably each bounce, the, 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 the volume of the photons is gonna diffuse outwards. And so what, what's the effect on, on the measurement there, if, if there is an effect? Okay, so the first question is about the cavity size, uh, the 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 um the beam size. So the beam actually can't cover both both cavity all the time, and the way that we selectively pump one versus the other is from frequency selecting using the pulse shaper. We did actually do a control experiment, say that we just have a regular cavity, then um we 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 frequently select actually the part that corresponds to the other cavity and make sure that we don't have any tailing effect in the 2D spectrum. So we know that the signal that we see is not just because of we pumping a small frequency tail of the other cavity. What, what is the spot size of, in your experiment? So about 100 micron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, uh, the cavity is about 50 micron. And, yes. and we want to cover both of them. We can, I think we can, we can focus it a uh, tighter but, but my students want to actually see both, both cavity. And, and the next question that you have is, is a good question. So this is not the so-called stable cavity because a stable cavity needs a curvature, right? Uh, but for this small cavity, the curvature might need to be very, very large. So we, we haven't actually done that. Um, the, the round trip is uh, determined by uh, the finesse. And I think it's about 10-ish if I remember correctly, or 20. Yeah, I have to go back to check that. Yeah, it's, it's not a whole lot, but, but it's, the, the nice thing about, about those systems is the, the, you know, we can make the cavity mode a little bit narrower, but, but right now the cavity mode is about um, 10 wave number. So it's already very close to the fluid half max of the molecular mode. And at some point the dissipation will just be completely dominated by the molecular mode if we make the cavity even narrower. And then we need to deal with the, the loss of, of reflected, mode, reflected light, right? The signal will become smaller. So we have some sort of like practical limitation there. So the, the, um, the amount of round trips is probably less than the Rayleigh range of the focus of the beam? I need to calculate that, but I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Wei. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Arun, please unmute. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Hi. So um, my question is uh, about this donor acceptor and the cavity mode, this slide that you showed. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the initial state? Initial state. And all that. Maybe we can go to the Hamiltonian. Initial state is the upper polariton. Yeah, but the initial. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. You mean and initial state of 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 of, of the, which when you say initial state, do you mean the? It's a delocalized over the all three, right? This right. is what one would expect from the Hamiltonian. Right. But the delocalization is is about this amount. So this is the okay. upper polariton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotcha. Majority mm -hmm. is, you know, the donor and only a small fraction that is a, that is a factor. And that's what we calculate and make sure that what we see is not just due to the delocalization. Uh -huh. And the 2D spectra that you calculate and the pathway classifications that you do, does that include this initial delocalization over all three of them? The 2D, we didn't calculate any 2D spectrum here. Okay, in so in this, okay. Got it. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, we, pure, we purely actually compared, you know, the experimental data and we showed mm -hmm. that this peak is way much larger than what we expected from mm -hmm. uh, the delocalization. Yeah. I see. Thanks. I think Chris uh, Middleton had a question. Yeah. Hey, wait, great, great talk. Um, 
Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I have it on, but uh, maybe it's not not quite working. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, would, would it be interesting at all if you could uh, change the shape of the excitation pulse in the time domain to either match the decay of the cavity or the you know reverse you know, the opposite you know have an exponential rising or exponential falling pulse that match the the cavity um, time scale. I haven't thought about that. That could be interesting. I I think if we can, I I might just make a narrow band pulse so that I can just you know, shoot the pulse all into one of the modes so that I can excite it even higher. Um, yeah, that's-, that's right, so well, It would be it'd be an addition to narrow, it would narrow it, right? But you could also, you could then also change, you know, if you just narrow it and, and um, you know, make it like a Lorentzian in the spectral domain, right? Then it would also be, you know, a double, exponential in the time domain. But with the pulse shaper, you could then make it either exponential rising or exponential falling in the time right. domain. And there could be some interesting dynamics with the, the optical cavity there. Yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. We, we might try that actually. I don't, on top of my head, I don't know what we're gonna see. Yeah, me either. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. it. <laughs> yeah, but that make it interesting. We could also add a chirp on, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Knows. Yeah. Thank you for okay. the suggestion. Yeah. Okay, no Giuseppe, I understand. Had a very similar question. Giuseppe, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was curious about sensing similar. So uh, uh, you mentioned some application in. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't uh, know quantum, for quantum information, so you can basically. So, sorry, I, I, I didn't hear you very clearly. Uh, Could you please try. repeat your question? Uh, sure. Can you hear me now? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, basically, I was interested in some things on, on the same lines so or on pulse shading. Uh, you mentioned some uh, that you can control the, the shape of the pulse in order to selectively enhance uh, one of the two polyton state, for example. Um, for uh, quantum um, information application. And in order to do that, is shaping the, the spectral envelope enough or or for example, the chirp of the pulse enough, or do you need higher order shading? I, that's a good question. I, at this moment, I'm not sure because uh, it's, I think it depends on the, the, the quantum simulation question that we wanna achieve, right? It, it really depends on what geometry that we will, we will make uh, for, for example, looking for a, a topological photonic topological insulator state, and then we need to launch the um, initial state uh, with a specific um, coherence, for example, and, and that really depends on what uh, theory tell us, and then we can we can design the pulse and then see if we can we can do that. Uh, I, right now, we just know that you know if we want to make this coherence, I mean there are simple coherences just like. Um, between between two two Ibra and cast state, we can make it. And, and we can measure that. Yeah. Um, I think it's really depend on the specific application. We, we I think uh, we will start with e simple, easy initial state because that usually a simple initial state, you know, it's a clean state, right? Per se, the, in the quantum simulation world, they always like to start with some clean state and see how the clean state would evolve into something complicated. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Andre Tekmako said in the chat, great talk. I have lots of questions, but I have to run. Okay, <laughs> let's talk soon. So you, you're okay. facing a series of questions and I get that Chris asked uh, that question about pulse shape and not, not for nothing, right, Chris? 
Uh, yeah, for sure. I have I have so, some experience there. Yes, yes. Yeah, and maybe, maybe <laughs> a couple of ideas, even commercial ideas, I would say. Well, I mean, of, of course, it would be quite easy to do with the Paul Schaefer, right? So that's that's why it comes to my, my mind. So I guess for for people who aren't familiar, um, my company, FaceTech, makes Paul Schaefer's, including the one that Wei's using in his experiment. And I'm also the FPA designer, Wei's going that. Yes, I did catch that. Yeah, it's also the 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 MTT detector that he's using for the imaging, and um, and and so yeah, it's quite easy experiment to try uh, with a pulse shaper. You, um, you just select different options in the software, and then you can create that uh, that those both those types of pulses that I was uh, asking about. Uh, and that is that is what Giuseppe just uh, suggested, if I understood the question correctly, right? So, uh, well, the question was actually about if you need something, you know, like fancy shapes or just a linear chair. We already do uh, well some job in in uh, uh, in sense that you can see some changes here. We can steer the interactions a certain way. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's also a question from Sec Armstrong. Okay, I, I yeah. Hear. All right, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm wondering about the length scale of the energy transfer between these two different carbonyl molecules. Do you think that they're still right next to each other and now they have a way to talk to each other or can you get energy transfer over long distances because the cavity mode is delocalized over a huge spatial distance? Good question. Um, in theory, I can only speak that in theory, they should, uh, don't, they don't care about where they are. That's in theory, but we did, we couldn't actually prove that because we don't know how to separate the two liquid phase molecule, you know, from each other. So and another a neat experiment that one can think to do is like, we might just prepare fil thin films, right? That are with one layer with one type of molecule, another layer with another molecule, and then show that we can mediate. This, this energy transfer. So in theory, they are not um, limited by their their distance anymore. Okay. More questions. I see none. Thomas, you? I see none. Oh, good. Well, maybe we have the same screen, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Wei, I am stopping the thank recording. You.